Wasn't that first portion of our service wonderful, rich in theology, rich in biblical teaching, uh, rich historic hymns, and the Apostles' Creed and things. I, I really enjoyed that. That um, uh, thrills my soul to be able to sing and recount all these wonderful spiritual truths. Let's so take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to begin in verse number 12 in just a little bit. 1 Corinthians 15, as you know, is on the resurrection. And there was a survey, and here was a question. Do you believe that after you die, your physical body will be resurrected someday? A pretty standard question, right? Um, only 36% of a large group answered yes. By contrast, these same people... Uh, 63% were absolutely certain that Jesus died and physically rose from the dead. These statistics um, suggest that a strong majority of Americans believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but only a minority of them think that they'll ever experience a bodily resurrection. More strikingly, a subgroup of these Americans, those who were evangelical Protestants who claimed a, a born-again faith, uh, only 60% of them have confidence in a personal resurrection. That's pretty staggering, isn't it? Albert Moeller, in commenting on this, said this, the vast majority of Americans simply have no idea that the Bible clearly teaches a doctrine of personal resurrection. And then he goes on to say, and that claim is central to the gospel itself, and that is absolutely true. Without a resurrection, you have no gospel, do you? They don't even understand it. There's no understanding whatsoever. In reality, though, Americans and American evangelicals are no different than the church at Corinth. As we saw last week, they already believed in Christ's resurrection, or else they wouldn't be Christians. I delivered unto you that what that that I received and that you already believe he said all these things and they understood that Christ was resurrected because Christ was raised the resurrection from the dead obviously is possible on the other hand unless men in general cannot be resurrected Christ could not have been raised let me say that one more time this is a very important statement okay because Christ was raised, resurrection from the dead obviously is possible, right? Unless men in general can be resurrected, Christ could not have been raised. And the reason for that is that the two resurrections stand or fall together. There could not be one without the other. Absolutely cannot be. Furthermore, if there is no resurrection, then the gospel is meaningless and worthless, the gospel that we believe. So since Christianity's basic truth claim is centered in historical events, what are these historical events? You remember what they were? If you listened last week, you, you would know, right? The, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is, in theory, the possibility of falsification of Christianity, Although this, this may make some Christians nervous, the fact is that if Jesus did not rise from the dead, Christianity could not be true. It's just all a system of lies. The bodily resurrection of the saints, by the way, is a consistent teaching of Scripture, Old and New Testament. Think about who mentioned bodily resurrection. Moses, Job, David or some in the Old Testament. Then you have Peter and Paul and Jesus in the New Testament. And the, the clear teaching of Scripture is that we will fellowship with God for eternity in our bodies. Now, it seems strange to, to a lot of people that some of those believers could have accepted one part of the truth without the other. How can that happen? How can they accept Jesus Christ's bodily resurrection and not accept their own bodily resurrection? The answer to that is that they were continued, there was a continuing influence of pagan philosophy in their lives and um, religions out of which many of them 
had come. And, and they were being influenced by it. Yet the survey that I mentioned just a couple minutes ago clearly indicates that many Christians today are being influenced by the materialistic philosophies of our day that all that is real is material. There is no spiritual reality at all. It's the only way that they could believe that. And so this passage, Paul is going to lay out seven uh, terrible consequences if there were no resurrection from the dead. If you'll stand with me, uh, we'll read beginning in verse number 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has been not been raised, by the way, let me stop right there. Did you catch the logic, how closely they're tied? If there is no resurrection of the dead, talking about us, there's no way that Christ was resurrected, you see? Uh, he ties it absolutely together. And then if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Lord, <coughs> we thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for the fact that it's historical fact and it cannot be denied. And we thank you for uh, scriptures which clearly teach not only the resurrection teaches the implications of a resurrection, and here we see the implications of no resurrection. I pray that you'll just burnish in our hearts the, the truth of the resurrection and our hope of glory in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. So, what if there were no resurrection? What if the resurrection were not real? Well, Paul says seven things. Number one, Christ would not be risen, verses 12 and 13. Look at verse number 12. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Now, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Actually, all these points are obvious, you're going to see. The outline is basically the verses of Scripture. It's just an obvious uh, observation. Paul ties our bodily resurrection so closely to the resurrection of Christ that if we do not rise from the dead, then Christ did not rise. Remember that the Corinthians were being uh, influenced by Greek and Roman um, philosophy. And the Greeks and the Romans had serious intellectual problems with the very notion of the resurrection of the body because pagan religion often held uh, that matter itself as opposed to the spirit is inherently evil. I was reading a book last night by a, a professor, and he was talking about that very thing, and he said that in reality, when Christians preached about a final judgment, Romans had no problem with that. They believed in judgment. Judgment was right and true, but when Christians preached a resurrection, they had a real problem with that because the, all the pagan philosophies said, for the most part, that the body is bad and the spirit is good, and so therefore, as you'll see in just a minute, they say at death, Greek pagans believed that the human spirit was at last liberated from the prison of the body. So your body is a prison, according to Greek philosophy. Um, sometimes I feel that way. I can't run as fast as I used to. I can't jump as high as I used to. Not that I even have the desire to do that sort of thing anymore, right? But, uh, the, the body was understood to be the source of all of our bad habits and desires because it was material. Now, isn't that exact opposite of the reality that the Bible teaches? I was uh, talking to my youngest son yesterday who's uh, out in Virginia Beach, and he, he was talking about the, the, the different rules that they have there in, uh, on base and that it's, it's very obvious what the right thing to do is. But he said, I'm just amazed at how many of these people, not only is it the right thing to do because of what he's doing, if you get caught, 
you're booted from that program. It's a very stringent program. And he said, they know the right thing to do, and yet they're willing to risk getting booted from the program to do the wrong thing that they really desire to do. And so it's not the body that is the problem, is it? it it's our heart. It's our souls uh, that, that are the problem. And so what they say is the, the body is understood to be the source of all our bad habits and desires and because it's material. Therefore, humans were, back in that time, there were two opposite extremes to what they would do. Okay, If the body is the source of bad habits, then there's this group. You've probably heard of the Epicureans. They said, you know what, just indulge the body then. If it's going to die and release our soul, but you got all these wonderful appetites, and it's all going to pass away, just indulge it. Then the opposite extreme, the ones that you've probably heard of more likely than the Epicureans, were the Stoics. And the Stoics said what? In order, to, uh, in order to really live life, you must discipline the body and deny the body of all of its appetites. And so you have opposite extremes. And um, death was seen as the moment when people were finally liberated from the material existence, which is often thought to be the source of of many of the humanity's problems. And this helps to explain why there was a tendency among the Corinthians to deny bodily resurrection and instead to favor some sort of spiritual resurrection or some sort of disembodied existence. Now we know, we're going to see from Scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, the wonderful truth is that we're going to have an embodied existence for eternity. We will be without our bodies for a little while, won't we? And then we'll be reunited in a resurrection. Think about, think about the, the, the storyline of Scripture. It starts out, Adam and Eve, with two very real bodies in the Garden of Eden. It ends with a multitude of very real people in very real human bodies in the Garden City called New Jerusalem. And the storyline, is, is, it, it's consistent. There's no permanent disembodied existence. The second effect of if there were no resurrection is this, then Christ would not be risen. I'm sorry, the gospel would be useless. The gospel would be useless. I looked at my first point, not my second. If Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Vain, empty, useless. For Paul, this is an either-or situation. If Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead, then the preaching of the gospel was absolutely useless because the content of the gospel would be what? False. It's a lie. In fact, to preach that Jesus was raised from the dead, if he was not raised, is to bear false witness. You know what the Bible talks about in the Ten Commandments, bearing false witness? So then, if that's true, then preaching the gospel is to bear false witness. He uses the word vain or empty or useless to describe preaching without a resurrection. What is empty preaching? Empty preaching is preaching without substance. It's it's mere words with no meaning. Uh, One of the latest fads in, in our popular culture is imaging. And so if you just say the right words, you're going to develop that image. It's actually not a late fad. Remember all the way back when, when the, they would tell you, tell yourself, I am somebody? You know what I'm saying? That's just mere uh, uh, imaging. It's uh, another one. I don't know if you've ever, how many of you are on social media, but you see uh, so many women who have this the Wonder Woman pose where they're slightly turned with a hand on their hip. That's actually not a popular pose because it's a cool pose. It's a popular pose because there is an an influencer with 60 million followers who says that if you strike that pose before you go into a meeting or in your pictures, it will give you power. That's emptiness. That's empty words. There's no need to preach because there's nothing to preach if there is no resurrection. Without the resurrection, the good news would be bad news, and there would be nothing worth preaching. There's no reason for me to stand up here if there is no resurrection. Without the resurrection, the gospel would be an empty, hopeless, meaningless 
bunch of nonsense. Can I say it that way? Because it's absolutely true. Also from verse number 14, not only would preaching the gospel be useless, faith in Christ would be useless. And if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith is in vain. What, what good is faith in a risen Savior is there, if there is no risen Savior? Be like, well, I can't say it. There's kids in here. But you know, in the winter, in the middle of the winter, there's this person whose initials are SC. You know who I'm talking about? Anyway, to be, I bet you guys know what I'm talking about. So let's move on. If 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 your creed tells you that Jesus has been raised from the dead, but that has not happened, and his body still lies in a tomb in Israel, then your faith is empty-handed. It's also empty-headed. Let me put it another way. If there is no uh, resurrection, then Christianity is no better than a fairy tale. Wishful thinking. If Jesus is not raised, Christians from across the ages have believed a lie and we placed our hope in a gigantic hoax. And so faith and preaching would be useless. But you know, if you think about it, preaching with substance is critically important, isn't it? The, the, the clear proclamation of the gospel uh, fueled the Reformation. God raised up men to boldly preach the gospel, boldly proclaim the truth. And biblical preaching led to the spiritual change that took place in the 16th and the 17th centuries, didn't it? It was biblical preaching. That preaching is a far cry from what comes out of pulpits today. Today, there's just a lot of little talks. Congregants are content with a talk, with a few practical tips to make your life a little bit better, uh, positive affirmations to make them feel better about themselves. But that kind of preaching does not build mature, godly Christians. As the church in the West continues to decline, we need to recapture the power and even the joy of believing and preaching in the risen Christ, don't we? The reformers boldly preached Christ in the face of opposition, didn't they? Alexander White, a Scottish minister, noted that there were three hallmarks of the Reformation. And one of them was clear biblical doctrine. One of them was recapturing uh, justification by faith. And the third one was what he called manly or masculine preaching. As we feel more pressure in the West as Christians, we need bold masculine preaching, don't we? The church, however, suffers from a lack of manly, Pauline, expository, demanding, thought, hard thinking, I guess is the best word, uh, hard hitting preaching. That's what fueled the Reformation. Pastors bear the weight of responsibility and of, of this kind of preaching. And this kind of preaching only occurs in conjunction with prayer, doesn't it? And so the pastor must be praying for uh, uh, the, 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 the preaching of the gospel that way. But it's not just the pastors. It's the church needs to bear the weight of that kind of, of praying as well. It's a responsibility of every congregation to be in prayer for the strength and the life and the fidelity of the pulpit, isn't it? One of the biggest surprises I've had in recent ministry has been the lack of interest in, in corporate prayer. It's, it's always been that way in the West, in my lifetime. It's always been that way. But what I'm talking about is that you would think, as quickly as our culture is changing, Going from being uh, take it, having predominantly Christian values to not having Christian values to now saying that we're the problem, 
knowing full well the persecution is coming. I have, I've literally not talked to one believer who does not think that persecution is not coming. Not one. Every believer I've talked to thinks persecution is coming. And you would think that the church, and I'm talking about the church in America, would be into corporate prayer, praying for the power of the gospel to work in people's lives, but they're still caught up in political initiatives. Let's influence our culture. Let's make sure we get the issues out there. Let's make sure that we vote the right person in. No, 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 that's all. That's completely wrong. Do you remember when the apostles went out? What, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that they devoted themselves, the church devoted themselves to the teaching of the word, to fellowship, to preaching, and to prayer, didn't they? They devoted themselves to prayer. And Paul, who was in one of the cities, the, the accusation they made, made against Paul and the apostles is, these are the men who have turned the world upside down. And why is that? It's because preaching is not useless because Christ has risen and one day we will rise. If there were no resurrection, then all preachers of the resurrection would be liars. Verse number 15, we are even found misrepresenting God if we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if that is true, that the dead are not raised. If, if there's no such thing as resurrection of the dead, then every person who claimed to have witnessed the risen Christ and every person who preached the risen Christ was a liar. They're all liars then. Paul, Peter, John, James, all of them, they're all liars if Christ did not rise. To deny the resurrection is to call the apostles and, and every other leader of the New Testament church not simply mistaken, but willfully mistaken. Or in other words, they're liars. If the apostles and the prophets and the New Testament writers lied about the heart of the gospel, why should they have believed anything else? Think about the fact. We know they're not liars. How do we know they're not liars? We know they're not liars because they were maligned. They were beaten. They were imprisoned. And oftentimes, they were martyred. And that kind of self-sacrifice uh, is not the stuff of which some liar, some charlatan is made of, is it? If you're a charlatan, if you're manipulating people for money, you're not going to die for your belief. You're going to figure out, you're going to lick your finger and figure out which way the wind's blowing and start moving that way, aren't you? But these men did not because Christ Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead. They're not liars. Amen? And so when we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're not liars either because Christ did raise from the dead. Next all men would still be in their sins. Look at verses 16 and 17. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. A dead Christ would be the chief of disastrous consequences from which all the other consequences result. And that consequence is we would still be in our sins and we would still be judged by God for our sins. If Christ was not raised, then death has won, hasn't it? Death has won. It conquered Christ and it will conquer all who will ever live. Without Christ's resurrection as a vindication of his atoning death, sin has no solution. What does Romans 6.23 say? The wages of sin is death. And Jesus, if he is dead, and he remains dead, and he's in some tomb somewhere in Israel, then he has no power to forgive either. You see? And so it's disastrous to think about the fact that there were no resurrection. If there were no resurrection, 
all former believers would have eternally perished. Look at um, verse number 18. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Every saint, Old Testament or New Testament Christian, who died would have forever perished. Those who have gone before us are dead with no bodily existence. And even worse, those who have died do not live on in the presence of God, awaiting the resurrection at the end of the age. And I do not know what it's like right now with a disembodied uh, existence, but at this time, according to Scripture, the saints who are in the presence of God are in the presence of God spiritually, and God is spirit, isn't he? They're spiritually with him, and they are having the most joyous time of their life, but they're also eagerly awaiting the resurrection. And I don't know how all that works. All I know, that's what Bible teaches. The bottom line is, if Christ did not raise from the dead, and we don't have a resurrection, then we place our trust in a dead man who cannot save us because he did not rise from the dead. And we're still in our sins, and our faith is useless, and there is no hope, and this life is all there, there, there is. And if this life is all that there is, I'm just going to be really blunt and direct. If this life is all that there is, then it doesn't matter what we do or how we live. All right? Now think about our culture for just a minute. We live in a culture that's materialist humanist. There's no spiritual existence, only physical. So guess what that means? How, how many, let me ask, have you had the experience where you've called a company or something on the phone and you know they're lying to you? Somebody will call you right back. How many's had that experience? Yeah, all of us. How many have had the experience, the speed limit's 65, and somebody goes by you probably doing 90? Or maybe you're going by people doing 90. I mean, think about all the consequences, all the things, the wrong things that we see going on in our society. In, 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 if you're just thinking, now I'm not talking about the existence of sin in the heart, but just thinking about the consequences of eternity, if there is no eternity, it doesn't matter if I follow the rules or not. It doesn't matter. There's, there's no reason to do good. There's no reason to love our neighbor. There's no reason to deny ourselves any sort of pleasure there's a Russian novelist who said it this way, everything is permitted and that's that. And that's the society that we live in. Moral anarchy reigns. You get frustrated with government and, and what they're, they're doing. They're doing that because none of them believe there is an eternity. And so therefore, they're going to do whatever they want. This is why so many in our culture dismiss the Christian truth claim without any consideration. If Christ be raised, they cannot do as they please. I don't know how many of you read the logic of some of the famous atheists, the, the apologists for atheism and evolution. There are several of them who have just been completely honest, who said, when I considered the existence of God, I decided I did not want to believe in God because if I believe there is a God, then I cannot uh, participate in all the immoral things, I won't mention them here, that I like to do. Right? And so you can live any way you want. And then the, the capstone of all this, verse number 19, if there is no resurrection, we are the most pitiable people on earth. Without the resurrection, Christianity is pointless. It really is. We're a bunch of fools. We're a bunch of rubes if there is no resurrection from the dead. If Christ is not raised, he's not alive, our Christian life is worthless, we have nothing to justify our faith, we have nothing to justify our Bible study, we have nothing to justify why you spend every Sunday here listening to me, um, we have nothing to justify our, our witnessing our service for him, our worship of him, and nothing to justify either our hope in this life or our hope in the next. We're, 
we deserve nothing but the compassion that is we, we keep for fools. You know what I'm talking about, right? If there was no resurrection, there's no reason for joy. We can endure much hardship. Let's face it, even the best of lives is difficult and sometimes characterized by sorrow. To live joyfully in life, we must live life full of the Holy Spirit, mustn't we? I cannot tell you. I mean, this life is good, but it's full of disappointments. I was thinking, well, I think about this a lot. My Cowboys haven't won a Super Bowl since the 90s. I mean, life is just full of disappointment, right? And that's just a lighthearted one. By the way, when was the last time the Redskins won a Super Bowl? <laughs> but uh, uh, you know how that is. Um, we better, I better keep, I'm meddling now. But, um, but think about this life. The, the joyful life, the joy that we have and everything that we see going on around us comes from the fact that the Holy Spirit lives inside us. And the more we ingest Scripture, the more we meditate on Christ, and the more we meditate on the future that Christ has secured for us, the more joy we have, no matter what our circumstances are. You find the source of true happiness and the source of abiding joy in the living Lord Jesus and the assurance that He is with you no matter what. The exercise of faith and love is a path to joy, isn't it? Faith in Jesus Christ and love for God and love for others. That's why Peter can say this. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not, you do not see him now, you believe in him and what? Rejoice. We can rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Do you have joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory? Do you? I mean, you, th you think about, look at everything going on around us. Y'all are wearing masks. A year and a half ago, we would never have thought that situation come around. Everything got canceled last year. And, and, and now the, 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 there's all kinds of political turmoil. And I talked to people. I was, um, I was in the tire store the other day. And, of course, one of the guys started talking about politics. And, and so... I, I kind of, have you ever, like, you don't really want to enter the conversation, but you just want to hear what people say, and so I said just enough to not, just to keep the people talking, right, several guys, and they were so upset by everything going on in our country, just upset, just listening to them, I, I thought to myself, you know, it is irritating, but because I have a joy that is founded on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the hope of a future resurrection, and all the promises of him who is faithful and true. These are minor irritants compared to the, the, the glory that we shall one day see in eternity. And that is why, verse number 20, Paul starts this way. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Praise be to God. Rather than being the most pitiable people on the earth, we are the most blessed. Lord, we thank you for the hope of the resurrection. So many wonderful promises. Such joy that we can have because of the resurrection. Life around us feels like it's spiraling out of control sometimes. All kinds of irritations, but Lord, because Christ raised from the dead, we will have an eternal existence without masks. We'll have an eternal existence without liars and angry people. We'll have an eternal existence where everything is perfect and made new with no more pain and sorrow where our thoughts will be perfect, where our understanding will be far greater than it is right now. Lord, we have so much to look forward to. I thank you that there is a resurrection because to think about there not being one 
is depressing. We thank You for what Jesus Christ did for our stead. In Christ's name, Amen.